Our next speaker, Julie Jewell, graduated from Stanford University in 2006. She is now the VP of Product Design at Facebook. Many of you may have already read her best-selling book, The Making of a Manager. In her book, she demonstrates how she has learned to build trust, boost self-confidence, and define her leadership style while working at Facebook. Julie is also an influencer on Medium and Twitter who inspires people all over the world by sharing her thought-provoking stories and giving constructive professional advice. Today, she will be sharing her insights into building a social network. Please join me in welcoming Julie Zhuo and moderator Shuo Chen, our advisor for BSCF, as well as general partner at IOVC and CEO at Shinec. Hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for all being here on a Saturday afternoon. Really excited to have you all um, because it's a real treat to have Julie here with us today. Um, so maybe without further ado, would love to maybe Julie have you start by telling everyone a little bit more about yourself um, and how you got here. Hi, well, thank you for moderating uh, with me today, Shua, and it's a pleasure to be here and spend a part of the afternoon with all of you. Uh, so I'm Julie, and I, uh, I, I attended Stanford maybe at this point 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, and when I graduated, you know, there was a little company that some of my friends had been going to, and it's called Facebook. And about the time that I joined, Facebook was about 100 people. Um, I had been doing the Mayfield Entrepreneurship Program. How many of you have heard of that? fellowship program. It's a, it's a program that I think goes through Stanford and Berkeley and it, you know, it taught me a lot about uh, entrepreneurship and it had taught me a lot about kind of like what being in Silicon Valley is all about and so I was very excited to join a startup uh, and because I had a few friends there and they loved it, you know, they encouraged me to intern and so I became Facebook's very first intern. Uh, I you know, joined as an engineering intern and I had a great experience and so that's where I decided to go full time after I graduated. Uh, and so over the years, I actually gradually switched from engineering into design, uh, mostly because at the time, you know, we were working on web software and design and engineering were, uh, you know, not that separate as, as maybe we, we see them today. All the designers were technical and we were all expected to write the front end of our, uh, you know, user interface. Um, and that sort of, I, uh, over the years, I decided that what I really loved was actually thinking about the user experience um, and thinking about you know, what were the people problems that we were trying to solve with our products. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I started to do more and more design and then some years later, out of the blue, you know, we were growing so quickly, um, my manager was like, wait, we need to hire more designers and we need more managers. Um, you get along with everyone, so why don't you start managing the team uh, you know, or a portion of the team? And so I said yes, because you know, again, this is a very early stage environment and we're all asked to you know, wear different hats and just do whatever needed to be done. I didn't really think any more beyond that. Uh, so I said yes, I started to manage half the team and that was when I realized I had really no idea what I was doing uh, as a manager. And so you know, the past 10 years have been for me a journey of learning um, both how to lead a team, how to manage design and product teams. Um, and today you know, I lead uh, the design team for uh, the Facebook uh, design and uh, formerly the research teams. And Julie, uh, obviously your new book just came out, The Making of a Manager. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, but before that, uh, you briefly mentioned at the end, obviously um, your latest role at Facebook is really overseeing the core Facebook app. How many people in the audience today actually found out about the event today through Facebook? Oh, cool. Actually, a number of people. I'm sure there's more people in the audience who didn't raise their hands, but uh, we were joking backstage earlier uh, with the student volunteers that um, even though we have Julie um, here with us today, we didn't get any sort of background algorithm tweaks or anything to promote our event, so they were joking. They were like, we really should. <laughs> um, but Julie, um, would it be great if you could share with us a little bit more about kind of how your role has evolved? We were talking earlier about your role kind of starting on the engineering side and then evolving into product, what has that been like? And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about product side as well and how that experience has been. So if you had asked me, you know, just starting out what I wanted to do, I think I would have told you, I don't know. And I know maybe, you know, maybe that seems like uh, something many of you relate to in the audience. Uh, but for me, you know, what was so exciting about being in an environment like Facebook uh, is that 
I didn't have to necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I could try a lot of different things. Um, and through the process of trying, you know, sometimes I'd realize, I'd learn a little bit more about myself, right? You know, I would try to do this type of project or, you know, do a project that was more around data analysis or do a, you know, an icon design project or, you know, I would engineer maybe the front end JavaScript for the, you know, search type ahead. And in each of those projects, you know, some of them maybe turned out well, some of them not so well, but the part that was really critical wasn't even so much like, oh, was it a, you know, A project or a B project? It was more, what what did I learn about myself and what did I learn were my strengths, uh, what did I learn on my areas of weakness and more, most importantly what did I learn were my passions because even if I wasn't good at something but yet I loved it, you know, I would probably do more and more of it and over time, you know, I would, uh, I would get better and that's sort of how I felt about design, you know, when I joined I was surrounded by five other designers, and many of them had been doing design for a really long time. Uh, you know, some of them had gone to design school. You know, I remember feeling like such an imposter because they would be debating color theory or typography. You know, they would play these games where it's like identify the font, and I would I would be awful at it. And to this day, I am not a great you know typographer. Um, I'm not you know the most skilled visual designer or um, or, or, or you know have the best graphic eye. And for a long time, I felt, you know, like, wow, what am I doing? How can I be a designer if I don't know these things? You know, if I didn't go to design school like my peers. But it was through the art process of, you know, being with them, you know, doing critique with them, which means like showing your work week after week to other designers and having people tell you why it sucks, uh, frankly. But, you know, th that, that process really builds you up and it teaches you, uh, you know, about uh, the things that, uh, that you need to do to become better in your field. And so, you know, this is the main lesson that I took away, uh, you know, over the course of having this career and trying all these things out is that what matters if, is if I really cared about doing something and I had people that I felt inspired by, you know, when I could say, you know, one day I want to you know, speak like, you know, my manager X, or I want to, you know, be able to critique and have, um, you know, great product ideas like my peer Y, then those are the people that I could learn from, and those were the people that uh, helped me, you know, get better and better. And actually, even before we came on stage, a lot of the volunteers as well, folks um, in the audience came up to you saying how they were big fans of your blog, um, and you had written a lot about these reflections. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you started writing, as well as kind of how that evolved into your current book. Absolutely. So when I was in, uh, in undergrad uh, at Stanford, you know, there was a program that I was a part of called the Section Leaders Program. And it's kind of like a, you know, you're TAing or you're teaching um, undergraduate computer science. And what I loved about that is that, you know, uh, I felt that through the process of teaching, uh, I got a lot better at the topic, right? And you'll hear, you know, many people say that, you know, it's like if you have to teach something, then you're really learning it, um, you know, in a much more uh, substantive way. You're really mastering the topic. And I have that relationship with writing as well. Um, oft oftentimes, you know, at the end of the week, I'll be pondering all these questions. I'll be working through, like, uh, you know, a struggle. I'll have some task, like I need to go and, you know, hire, you know, a great leader for design, and I'll feel like uh, that's like a really overwhelming task. You know, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Uh, and I, I realized that sitting down, you know, on a weekend or a Friday and just writing out kind of like a letter to myself uh, about, you know, what advice I would give myself for this particular topic uh, was really clarifying for me. You know, it was very therapeutic. And after I had written it, you know, it would become a little clear in my mind. And, you know, I don't, I don't like, pretend that everything I've written, like, I've always done, right? Part of, like, the writing is, for me, you know, trying to make the, the theory of it or the thing that I want to do sink in because the action is oftentimes harder than the theory. Uh, so, you know, it's like a reminder for myself oftentimes to, like, do this or pay attention to that or, you know, approach a design problem, you know, from first principles rather than from intuition or whatever else might be influencing me at the moment. But that was a lot of my uh, my thesis for writing. And I think the second thing that really uh, made me want to write more publicly, because, you know, that I had been writing privately, I'd been journaling, doing that. What made me write publicly was, um, in fact, 
that I was at the time, you know, in my job and, um, you know, and I was at this point like a mid-level manager. And one of the things I knew that I was struggling with was actually uh, speaking up in front of a large group, like doing what I'm doing today, you know. Uh, some years ago, this would have been like the scariest thing for me. And I wanted to get more comfortable, you know, expressing myself in large meetings. I had gotten feedback from my manager that, you know, hey, Julie, you're great in one-on-ones, but whenever the room is like 10 people, like, we don't hear from you anymore. How many of you have ever gotten that feedback? So, you know, so, so as I was trying to figure out what to do with this, um, one idea that came up was like, well, what's something that seems maybe a little scary to me, and that was publishing opinions on the internet. Um, and because it seems scary, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make this a New Year's resolution. I'm going to just ask, you know, set the resolution to be write something about what, you know, the things that I'm already kind of blogging or, you know, sorry, uh, privately journaling about, and I'm gonna go and publish uh, one article a week. And the whole goal is not that this article is so great or it's so, you know, it's or that any, even anyone needs to read it. Uh, it's that I just need to get comfortable with the fact that other people will read it and see it and, you know, know that, like, I've expressed an opinion of mine. And, you know, when you do something just 52 times in a row, it just, at the end of it, you know, it becomes easier. Uh, and I remember the first few weeks it was, like, it was really daunting, you know, staring at this blank page, and I, rem I would write a sentence, and then I would immediately start editing it because it didn't sound perfect, and, you know, I was trying to actually get over this, like, hang-up that I had, that everything that I said had to be, like, amazing or, you know, or, or, or whatever, right? Um, but when you just do something like that for 52 weeks, the repetition and the consistency makes it so it actually becomes more and more natural and it becomes easier and easier. And I think that was a large part of what made it more comfortable for me to, I think, do more of that, to start to speak up in meetings, to kind of get over uh, a lot of the fear of, you know, having a voice in front of a large group of people. And I remember reading one of your LinkedIn posts where you talk about this and you talk about how before you started the current blog, you tried it a few times where you would publish anonymously and people wouldn't even discover the article. And I think that's very relatable because I think a lot of us find it challenging to really publish things that's written online because it's a lot easier to be criticized than something that's recorded video or even kind of in a talk setting. So I think that's definitely really great advice. Um, for younger audiences sitting here today, it would be great to talk a little bit about um, kind of what it's like to break into product today because it's a very different landscape than it used to be when you first started. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, for a product in general, yes. Yeah. So I think one thing that's really interesting is when I started, you know, is obviously the t to technologies and the platforms have changed. But we were thinking a lot of, you know, the startups and, and what people were excited about was using the internet um, and creating applications or creating services, right? And I, you know, that's still big today, but I also see this uh, new trend towards uh, much more physical devices, you know, things where you can take uh, it with you and it's connected to an app. Um, recently, I just started using a Willow breast pump, um, and I loved it because it was, you know, designed to be a breast pump that you could use while you're out on the go, and everything about it, everything about the setup, the way that you track what's going on happens through an app. You know, the device is uh, a very simple, and, um, you know, it's not, it doesn't have all these bells and whistles and buttons and all that that, that it used to because, you know, we can, we can build these things much more together, and I think that'll be a very interesting aspect of, you know, this new generation of companies or technologies or products. Um, I think another thing that, you know, uh, is a new trend as well is just the idea of product design as being much more holistic and, as, uh, and, and much more responsible. I think we've seen a lot of examples of companies that have grown very, very quickly, very, you know, uh, over a period of time that have become global companies. And in fact, though, you know, sometimes through that process of scale, um, you know, as the builder, you're thinking about the best case scenario. You know, you're thinking about like, oh, I can imagine this family and they're going to share these photos and it's going to help them like be more closely connected to their cousins that live on the other side of the world. But it's also necessary now more and more to think about, you know, well, in what ways will this technology be used not for good, but by, you know, a nefarious party? Um, it's more important to think about who are the, who are other specific audiences that might actually, uh, you know, not benefit from this particular idea. Um, and, and the product being much more about defining not just people as a whole, but being more specific about which uh, you know, audience are you really thinking about this for? And 
to actually segment your audience and understand, you know, who are the people who are going to benefit the most? That's obviously, you know, they're going to be most excited. But who do we have to also pay attention to? Uh, and who might actually be, you know, a bad actor in that system? That's perfect. And um, I would love to continue uh, with advice for younger audiences, especially for students in the audience. Um, and we'll come back to kind of for pro alumni and professionals in a bit. Uh, but in terms of specific advice for students who are currently in school, is there anything that they can do um, to better prepare themselves for product and design and for thinking about planning ahead for their career as of now? The best you know, advice that I always have for students is it's okay if you don't know what you want to do. You don't have to have a perfectly mapped out life plan. Uh, but what is really, really helpful is just you know taking every opportunity as they come and being proactive. And that means going out and asking questions, you know, and not sometimes being afraid to sound stupid because I know that you know when I work with students the people that always impress me the most are the ones who aren't letting their ego get in the way of their learning right who are just so eager to try new things that they haven't done before to ask for help if they're stuck to say hey you you, you mentioned this acronym or I didn't understand what you were saying can you clarify you know what you meant um, because it shows me that they they truly are trying to internalize and learn and not just you know maybe look good or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, be seen, uh, you know, in terms of like advancing their own careers. And I think the knowledge that you gain and the things that you try to do proactively, they stay with you forever and you will always benefit from them. And in terms of alumni um, st sitting in the room, especially for folks who are already working, um, you know, in school, we don't really learn how to be good managers. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about kind of best practices you've learned over time uh, to really be a good manager. Um, and also maybe talk about some of the toughest challenges you've overcome in becoming a good manager. I think the most critical ma uh, lesson for being a good manager is, is first understanding what management is. And I define it as it's getting a team of people to have a great outcome. And you need to first, to know what a great outcome is, you have to define that great outcome. Make it tangible, make it understandable for everyone. But secondly, the biggest lever that you will always, always have in getting a group of people to get to a great outcome is the people. And you know, at the end of the day, managing is caring. Managing is caring about the individuals on your team. It's trying to get to know them, to build trust with them, to understand their strengths and weaknesses, to understand your own because you know it's a two-way relationship, right? It's not just the other person doing this, it's also how you're coming across. And in that process of having those interactions with one another, uh, you know, getting to a point where you can help them come together with the team to, to, to do the best job. It's honestly about caring for people. So um, given that we have limited time, I wanted to ask one last question, which is any kind of specific advice for folks sitting in the audience that they could walk away kind of do in the next day or week um, so that they walk away feeling pumped and ready to do something? Sit down and uh, write down, you know, maybe spend 30 minutes or an hour and write down what your goals are for yourself. You know, what do you care about for the next one year, the next three years, the next five years? I often think we don't, we're not intentional enough about maybe what, where we really want our careers to go and that you know, regular practice every three months or every six months of answering that question for ourselves is, is one of the most important things we can do for our own careers. Amazing, thank you so much for your time, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.